In a honeybee hive, this is what a worker sees the first 25 to 30 days of her life. Pitch darkness. They have incredible eyes, as we will see later, but they cannot see in the dark. Yet they have an incredible amount of responsibility to do inside this present darkness. But that's later. Right now she is faced with the challenge of getting out of her cell in which she hatched from. It is less than a quarter of an inch in diameter, and it's just as big around as she is. So it is a tight squeeze. Males and females are helped differently during this process. Honeybee males, which are drones by the way, are not designed to do any work, but only to mate. They mate only once, and then die. In other bee species, it's a little different, however. Male sweat bees, for example, are designed to help carry food and assist in building the nest. Until the female, its mate, assumes her position as queen and his services are no longer needed. After that, he has to leave and find another mate. If he doesn't do this, the new queen will quite frankly sting him to death since he can't be trusted around the eggs, especially since he's hungry. Honeybee drones are just a lazier than normal male within the bee kind. You can argue that it's because they aren't programmed to help carry food, and they're not. Or you could blame it on the amount of mothering they receive since day one. Even if the drones don't need help out of their cell, the nurse bees pretty much baby them out anyway. I'm not sure why they do that, because I've taken frames with drone brood on them, shook all the nurse bees off, and set the frames off to the side somewhere to melt them into wax later. And the drones that hatched in the process were able to pull themselves out of their cells without help. So I'm not sure why the nurses feel they have to help the drones hatch, but they do. Female workers, however, are on their own when they hatch. If they get stuck, they can signal for help all they want, but everyone ignores her. Only when the female is completely out of her cell is when the nurse bees may attend to her and clean her up. This is totally intentional on the nurse bees part. Female worker bees are the backbone of the hive's production and profit. They are responsible for the security and protection of the hive against yellow jackets and other predators, bringing in food, nursing, and everything else that involves hard work and care. They need to be strong enough to face the many challenges that lay ahead of them and to meet the needs of the colony. That is why they are not helped out of their cell at all. She is never alone during this process, but no one is to intervene despite her calls for help. There will be many times in our life, or there have been times, where we are going through a hard time, we ask God for help and strength, yet He doesn't answer the way we'd like, because, surprise, surprise, we are going through a test. This is in direct reference to a scene in God's Not Dead 2, but everyone who has been a student before knows that the only time instructors are absolutely not talking to you is when a test is in session. It's not that they don't care or are not in the mood to help if you are stuck on a problem. On the contrary, they are being very helpful to you by letting you figure it out for yourself. God knows what is miles and miles ahead of us and is using this hard experience now to train and shape us for that time to come and the things beyond that point that are to come in their own time. At this point, some people may have this what's-the-point attitude and think that I may as well leave Christianity now while the getting out is good. God is just playing a game with me. What they don't realize is that if it was disaster that is to come, or hardship, it will come anyway regardless if you believe in God or not. If you are not strong enough or prepared and mature enough to handle it when it does come, you are in for a world of hurt regardless if you are a Christian or an atheist. That is why God leads us through tests in our life as we grow in fellowship with Him. They are not fun at all, just ask the children of Israel. He never said it would be fun, but they are necessary for what is to come.
and he wants us to be ready for them. It is no different in a honeybee colony. Once the newly hatched worker is cleaned up and ready to work, no one shows her what to do or how to do it either. That's because they don't have to. She already knows through preset instructions God has programmed in her brain. The more mature she gets with age, the more information is unlocked and activated for certain jobs she is ready to take on. All honeybee workers are born with the equipment they need to pollinate flowers. But her wing muscles need some time to grow and strengthen first, before she can do that work. In the meantime, there is other work just as important that she is instinctively led to do first. As soon as we ourselves answer God's call to be born again in Christ, we are equipped with the armor of God from the start. But we need some time to be tested in the Spirit and to grow in Christ first before we can serve. The Great Commission to us is very much like pollination work to bees. Jesus described it as a ripe harvest ready to be reaped and sown. Lots of us have a passion and desire for it, whether it be in mission work overseas, teaching, or in a simple local ministry of some kind. But God often calls us to wait and grow first. Why? Because we are not ready to receive that promise yet. In the meantime, there is something else we are led to do instead while we wait. If the waiting part isn't that bad, this other assignment that God gives to us while we wait isn't always going to be something that we like either. But it is necessary. If God promises us something, He isn't going to always open doors to that right away. There is a reason God had to lead the children of Israel through the wilderness 40 more years before letting them enter the land He promised them through Abraham. They were not tested or ready to enter into it when God had first called them out of Egypt, nor when they saw it in person in the book of Numbers. God never backs down on any of His promises even if he waits 10 or 20 years to fulfill them in our lives. It's just that 20 years was how long it took you to be able to bear the responsibility of receiving what was promised. Honeybees are no different. Within the first 20 to 30 days of the honeybee's life, she will take on either supply keeping or nursing as her first jobs. Supply keepers are simply responsible for handling the nectar and pollen brought in by the field workers. They store it for easy access to nurse bees, which need it to feed the larvae and other bees that are hungry. Nurses do many tasks, but are responsible for feeding the larvae and keeping them at the right temperature. If the larvae are fed too much royal jelly, for example, they will develop into queens instead of workers. The hive doesn't need that to happen unless half the colony needs to swarm due to overcrowding. If too little food is fed to them, the nurses that hatch will be too small or weak for complicated tasks. As for temperature control, if the larvae get too warm above our normal body temperature or too cool below it, they will die. Nurses keep track of the exact temperature through thermometer sensors in their antennae. If it is too cool, crowding over the cells and shivering produces heat. If temperature gets too warm, nurses fan their wings over the cells to create a cool draft. There are many other jobs the workers take on after these starting jobs. But after the worker is 30 days old, she is technically mature enough to work as a soldier or a field worker. Not every bee will move on to either of these jobs, though. Another thing to note is that when we are called into the Great Commission, not all of us will become what we are expecting to be. I wasn't expecting to be a beekeeper, do a lot of research on bees, and then speak about them, for example. Some of us may want to be a bush pilot or a Bible smuggler like I wanted to do in ministry. But God has other plans for some of us. Some of us are called to be prayer warriors instead, and only that, which are very, very valuable in spiritual warfare while others are led to do simple community service and minister there through our example and character apart from the world and plant seeds accordingly. Honeybees are exactly the same. 
They are all designed from birth to pollinate flowers and defend the colony against attack. But there are some that will never work that job. Undertakers are those particular workers. Undertakers are the ones responsible for cleaning out the trash and throwing out the dead and dying. Fun job, huh? They throw away all food that is old and moldy. Likewise, larvae that is sick, infested with parasites, or dead are kicked out of the hive too. Same is true with adult bees as well. If they don't do this, bad bacteria will multiply until the hive will become more susceptible to sickness and disease through contamination. Germs are not treated lightly by honeybees under normal circumstances, and that is a good thing because you are drinking their honey. No one told this worker to serve as an undertaker at all. She voluntarily followed her instincts to spend the rest of her life doing this dirty job. Now, field workers have the hardest job of all. These bees work so hard around the clock during daylight hours that they will only live up to 10 to 15 more days depending on how far they have to fly every day. But this is what the bee was designed to do from the very beginning. How does this pencil out then? If it takes 30 days for a bee to be mature enough to become field workers, yet those bees are dying every 15 days through complete and utter exhaustion. Well, in early summer, the queen can lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. These eggs hatch in a way that eventually gives the colony a constant and steady supply of workers for all the different positions every day, including field workers. This supply rate varies depending on how much the queen is able to lay every day. Also, the field force is divided up into different branches, the most important of which are the scouts. The scouts are the ones that do all the wandering around and fly the most miles so that the others won't have to. Her job is to locate food and report back to the workers. This way everyone can fly straight to the food pick up as much as they want, and fly straight back home. No detours, no scenic routes. The scout bee already did that for them. Honeybees in particular are capable of long-distance flight. All bees look for food that is as close to home as possible. But the honeybees have been recorded flying up to five to six miles one way to find food if necessary. Traveling empty, they can fly that distance at 15 miles per hour. So if wind conditions are just right and there are no air currents hindering them, they can get from here to there in roughly 20 minutes. Since most of us can run five miles, that might not seem very impressive, but if we were to run a distance comparable to a honeybee's scale, we would need to run from Medford, Oregon to San Diego, California, about as fast as military aircraft can fly to get there in 20 minutes. That's what five of our miles looks like to a honeybee. Once a bee makes it to the flowers, that's where things get interesting. Even if these types of flowers are something she has never seen before, she knows exactly where to find the nectar in these plants. Nectar is hidden inside the flower so it cannot be easily taken by just anyone. Bees and other pollinating creatures don't have a problem finding it because God created the flowers to have visual instructions for them on the flower petals, instructions that can only be seen through ultraviolet vision. These are flowers located in Hawaii, and yes, that is their actual color pattern that we can see with our naked eye. But even our normal everyday flowers have a similar pattern that we cannot see because we don't have ultraviolet vision to see it. But the bees can see it very clearly. Those colors help the bee to visually pinpoint where the nectar is by following the colors to the darker red. We'll learn more about their eyes later. As the bee approaches the flower blossom, she has multiple ways of determining if there is enough nectar in the flower to make the visit worth it. Its antennae have smell sensors that are sensitive enough to allow the bee to smell nectar in the blossom from a little ways away. 
but just like a butterfly. Its feet have little taste sensors that allow it to tell how much nectar there is just by touching the petals. Apparently, the petals taste differently depending on how much nectar there is. If their feet look like grappling hooks to you, that's because they are in a way. For rough surfaces, they use those claws to hang onto near vertical faces. They are sharp enough so that they can stick to any rough surface and climb anywhere they want with ease. But the claws are small enough they only tickle our skin if the bee lands on us. For smooth surfaces, they have suction cup hair, strong enough that once fully deployed, the bee can withstand at least 70 mile power wind gusts while on the windshield of your car. So once the bee finds a flower that meets its liking, it will use a combination of claws and suction cups to anchor itself to the blossom so the bee won't fall off even if the flower is rocking back and forth in the wind. That's how something as heavy as a bumblebee can hang on to a very little plant with ease. Not every flower is the same, and the nectar can be a little more challenging to reach than with most flowers. So God has made a particular bee for a certain flower to have a long enough tongue to reach to provide a nectar. Tropical euglossa bees, for example, in Florida, have an inch and a half long tongue. That might not seem very impressive until you realize that the bee itself is only seven-eighths of an inch in length. So this bee has a tongue longer than itself is. This enables the bee to visit flowers like firebush that have long tubes, but it is mainly an orchid pollinator. That probably explains why it is created so beautifully, and it is one of the most beautiful bees in the bee kind. As the bee inserts its head into the blossom to reach the nectar, its hair will gather pollen particles in the process that will be passed around from flower to flower as the bee makes its visits. Any extra pollen dusting the bee is placed into pollen baskets, either on the hind legs and or under the abdomen depending on the bee species, like this sweat bee. Now, there are two different kinds of pollen, dry pollen and wet pollen. Dry pollen comes from wind pollinated plants, like grass and trees, and this is the pollen most of us sneeze and cough over every time spring is in the air. Bees do not gather this, nor do they like it. Number one, it is dry and powdery, which turns into a rock hard mess when any kind of liquid is added to it. So the bees can't turn it into food at all because of that. Number two, it doesn't have any useful vitamin compounds in it like wet pollen does. Plus, if nothing else, it just tastes terrible. Wet pollen comes from flower blossoms and has ingredients and vitamins that, over time, can help some of us overcome pollen allergies, depending on the flowers the pollen came from, of course. For people that are sensitive to any kind of pollen, a bit of honey every day may help if you are sensitive to allergy medicine, and a lot of people are. Flower pollen is wet and sticky and actually tastes pretty good. However, the stickiness of the pollen is not the reason it sticks to the bee. Bee hair is designed to be electrostatically charged as air passes over it in flight. This literally pulls the pollen onto the bee so that she doesn't have to spend a lot of time rubbing herself all over the flower while drinking the nectar. Now, as far as honey production is concerned, it takes 1,100 honeybees visiting 4 million blossoms to bring in enough nectar to produce this quart jar of honey. Honeybees can carry at least half their weight in nectar and pollen. In comparison, a person weighing 140 pounds would have to drink up 45 pounds worth of juice and carry 25 pounds of food on their back and be able to run to wherever they came from at 300 miles per hour. That's almost as fast as Formula One. How does a bee do that? Well, it is impossible for us because we have a single stomach that connects directly to our digestive tract. Everyone's food consumption and stomach capacity is different, but your digestive tract can only consume so much food in so much time 
so your stomach warns you through aches and pains to stop eating after maybe 5 pounds of food. Honeybees don't have that problem because they have two stomachs. One leads to the digestive tract like ours does. The other just acts as a transportation tank that fills up like a balloon and is only limited to the size of the bee. It's called a honey stomach because this is where the first stage of honey production takes place. The stomach does not need nerves that send warning messages to the brain like the digestive stomach does, so the bee can drink as much nectar as she can lift. The bee knows her limit and takes into account how far away home is so that she will not drink more than she can carry back. As mentioned earlier, the fuller she is, the slower she will be able to fly. And the slower she flies, the more at risk she is of predators. Bees have little scales on their exoskeleton that detect sound waves and also sense movement near it, just like the sensors fish have in their scales. This allows them to sense danger even before they see it. But the best part is the bee's eyes. Bees and all other insects do not have eyeballs like mammals and other creatures do. The eyes on the sides of the bee's head are actually a compound of smaller optics that work together as one eye. It is made up of 6,900 lenses called facets. Each facet sees a piece of the world like a pixel in a digital image and are all angled so that the bee can see in all directions at the same time without having to turn its head very much except to track movement a little better or to check blind spots. Each facet can be adjusted to different exposure levels, either individually or as a facet group of 150 facets at once, like the group reflecting the blue light here. 13,800 optical points of view from both compound eyes stream into the brain at once. The viewpoints are analyzed by the brain and is condensed into one big picture of the outside world. The brain can record the scene into memory at a fast enough rate for the bee to see in 360 frames per second. Our eyes can only see in 60 frames per second in comparison. This is actually how most insects dodge predators like birds and other insects and is one reason why it is hard to swat a fly. If you swat at it, it has the equivalent of two seconds to get away instead of only two tenths of a second like we see. That's all good stuff, but how do they find their way back home? Well, God made the bees to literally have a biological GPS unit inside their head. It's scientifically called a biomagnetic compass. Birds and migratory fish have the same feature. God designed the bees' antennae with magnetic sensors strong enough to detect the fields of longitude and latitude and recognize them as coordinates in the brain. Their antennae are also equipped with a variety of other sensors that monitor airspeed and air currents so that they can calculate how far they have flown and how much air currents have helped or hindered them during flight. Magnetic coordinate reading and compasses are not always reliable if you are around something that produces interference to that, like steel, for example. Plus, there has been talk as to whether or not radio waves interfere with their biotic compass reading. However, bees have a second navigational ability that solves this problem. All bees have five eyes total, including wasps. We've talked about their compound eyes already. There are also three smaller eyes on the top of their head known as simple eyes. These special eyes are called simple because they only see light instead of scenery. It is said they are used to help the bee triangulate the sun's position and know her degrees of travel from 0 to 360 from the sun using planes of polarization. It's pretty much like the degrees on a compass, only the sun is at 0 degrees instead of north. Honey bee scouts relay directions to their fellow workers through a waggle dance. The food source waggle indicates how many degrees they are to fly from the sun's current position. The sun is always referenced straight upwards like so. If the scout dances at a 45 degree angle like this, that means everyone has to fly 45 degrees from the sun 
in order to find the source of food. How far they have to fly is displayed by how long the scout waggles in that 45 degree angle before turning back around and repeating it. Why do they do that? Well, remember, the hive is dark inside. Bees can only communicate through sound and vibrations and are only aware of their surroundings accordingly. So this is kind of like sign language for the blind, if you will. How can the scout know she is pointed exactly at 45 degrees then? Bees are very sensitive to gravitational direction. They don't just know which way is down from up. They know how many degrees it is. It's as if they are reading a digital protractor. Even if 15 minutes has gone by since the scout bee made that plot and relayed that information to the hive, that's not a problem. The movement of the sun does not confuse the bees like it would us because they can accurately track the slight change in the sun's position every few minutes through an internal time clock. They can do this even from inside a dark hive. This ability, along with some basic math, allows them to know exactly where home is or the flowers at any given time as the sun continues to move left to right across the sky. This is why some pilots study bees and birds to find out better ways of navigation and coordination. So when you think about how God designed the bees and other pollinators so precisely perfect for what they pollinate, you can't help but marvel. It takes us years of testing and programming to create robotic hands that so much as cook meals for us. God did 100 billion to the 70th power times more than that when he created life in just one day. In fact, not only did he create it, the Hebrew word for create Moses chose to use in Genesis 1.1 means to dispatch into existence. If any one of these aspects of the bee is missing regarding its senses, its ability to calculate, or the colony working so much in unity together without mistake, either it will make the bee's job harder or impossible depending on what you take away. If it becomes impossible, then the bee will go extinct. If you develop a company of any type, either you have the right workers for the right positions, and those workers are supplied with the right tools for the right jobs, or the company will go bankrupt from lack of profit and production. We really and truly worship a master designer.